Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Welcome to our prelims daily quiz. If you are finding these initiatives to be helpful, do let us know by liking the video and by sharing your comments and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. So let's get started by looking at the first question for today. Which of the following fundamental rights are available to both citizens and foreigners except for enemy aliens? Article 14, 19, 21, 25, 29. See, there are certain fundamental rights which are available only to the citizens of India and there are few other fundamental rights which are available to both citizens and as well as foreigners provided if the foreigners do not fall under the category of enemy aliens. This essentially refers to foreigners from an enemy state which is often declared during times of wars with other countries. So even foreigners enjoy certain fundamental rights as long as they do not fall under the definition of enemy aliens. So amongst the fundamental rights that have been mentioned over here, Article 14, 21 and 25, they are available to both citizens and foreigners. That is right to equality and equal treatment before law and Article 14 and right to life under Article 21 and right to freedom of religion under Article 25. These three rights amongst the given options are available to both citizens and foreigners. So option A is the right answer. See here, I have shared a list of fundamental rights that are available to both citizens and foreigners except enemy aliens and also the fundamental rights that are available only to the citizens of India. So right to equality, protection in respect of conviction for offences under Article 21, right to life and personal liberty under 21, right to elementary education under 21A, protection against arrest and detention under 22, prohibition of human trafficking and forced labour and prohibition of child labour under Article 23 and 24 respectively, then the fundamental rights related to religion under Article 25, 26, 27 and 28. These are the rights that are available to both citizens and foreigners equally. But certain rights are available only to the citizens of India. And this includes Article 15, prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex or place of birth. Because foreigners can be discriminated on these grounds, especially place of birth. Next, Article 16, equality of opportunity in matters of public employment. Of course, this right is not available to foreigners because government jobs can be reserved to just Indian citizens. Then Article 19, which provides for freedom of speech and expression, the right to assemble peacefully without arms, the right to form associations and unions, the right to freely move around the territory of India, to reside and settle in any part of India, and to practice any profession or any occupation, trade or business. These key fundamental rights in Article 19, they are available only to Indian citizens and not to foreigners. Then even the rights given to minorities under Article 29 and 30 that provides for protection of language, script and culture of minorities and the rights of minorities to establish and administer educational institutions. These are also available only to Indian citizens and not to foreigners. Now this topic was taken up for discussion because we have an article in the Hindu according to which the government is seeking a law to curtail the rights of foreigners especially with regard to their right to approach courts, especially when they are found to be in violation of visa norms. If the government acts against foreigners, those who are violating visa norms and conditions, their right to approach courts for relief is being questioned by the government because the government has argued that when the rights under Article 19 are not available to foreigners, then how can foreigners who are violating visa norms be allowed to approach courts for relief? Now let's look at the second question. Which of the following statements are correct? Border infrastructure creation is largely the responsibility of the Ministry of Home Affairs. Department of Border Management under the MHA deals with the management of borders including coastal borders, strengthening of border guarding mechanisms and creation of related infrastructure and border areas development etc. Both the given statements are correct. So option C is the right answer. See, the Ministry of Home Affairs, which is responsible for the country's internal security, is also responsible for border management. Under the MHA, a dedicated department has been established for this purpose, 
known as the Department of Border Management. It deals with the management of borders, including the coastal borders, and strengthens border guarding mechanisms and is involved in creating any border related infrastructure and promoting development in the border areas. For this purpose, under the department, two dedicated divisions have been constituted that is, Border Management Division 1 and Border Management Division 2. Division 1 is responsible for managing the international borders and securing them, including the deployment of border guarding forces along India's international boundaries. Whereas Division 2 is responsible for all the other matters related to coordination and concerted action by various other institutions of the central and state governments, which includes administrative, diplomatic, security, intelligence, legal, regulatory and economic agencies of the country that are involved in border management. And this leads Division 2 to coordinate with state governments, district administration and all the other concerned agencies and institutions of the centre that deal with international borders. This would include intelligence agencies and security forces, including border guarding forces, along with the Ministry of External Affairs, which is responsible for diplomatic relations with the neighbouring countries. So the task of coordinating with all these institutions lies with Division 2 and it is also involved in implementing the Border Area Development Programme that focuses on promoting socio-economic development in the border areas. It is also responsible for dealing with coastal security and establishing Land Ports Authority of India which in turn is a statutory authority for setting up and maintaining ICPs or integrated check posts in order to promote trade and movement of people along the land borders of India. Now this question was taken up because according to this article in the Hindu, 32 new border roads have been built by India along the Chinese border. The Ministry of Home Affairs has informed a parliamentary panel that 32 strategic border roads along with helipads have been constructed and upgraded along the Chinese border as a part of India's improving preparedness following the 2020 Galwan clashes between India and China in the Ladakh sector. The Home Ministry has been seeking additional funds from the Finance Ministry to further scale up India's border infrastructure, particularly to develop strategic border roads along the Chinese border, which has been accelerated by the Indian government since 2005. From 2005, under the Indo-China Border Roads Phase 1, high priority has been given for strategic border roads along the Chinese border and the second phase of this project has been launched after the Galwan clashes of 2020. Now let's look at the third question. With reference to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or JCPOA, examine which of the following statements are correct. It deals with Western economic sanctions against Russia. It was signed between P5 countries and the European Union. Russia has recently breached the terms of the agreement. All the three given statements are incorrect. So, option D is the right answer. See, JCPOA or Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is also referred to as the Iran nuclear deal. This deal was signed in 2015 between the P5 plus 1 countries and Iran and the European Union. Here, P5 plus 1 includes the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, that is, US, Russia, China. UK and France. The plus one over here refers to Germany, which played the role of a key mediator in negotiating and working out the Iran nuclear deal. And of course, Iran is also party to the agreement along with the European Union. This historic deal provided for placing curbs on Iran's nuclear weapons program and in return for Iran accepting these restrictions and curbs. Iran would be aided by the other countries, particularly the European countries, in developing civilian nuclear technology and Iran agreed to limit its uranium enrichment program and to transfer the enriched uranium stockpile to other European countries who would in turn provide civilian nuclear technology to Iran. In return for accepting all these restrictions, the United States agreed to lift the crippling economic sanctions which it had imposed on Iran to target its nuclear weapons program. This deal had helped in reducing tensions between US and Iran and it was being successfully implemented until 2018. But in 2018, the United States under President Donald Trump alleged 
that Iran was breaching the terms of the deal and that it was secretly building and developing nuclear weapons. These allegations of President Trump were largely baseless as these allegations were contradicted by the other members of the agreement, including the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was responsible for inspecting Iran's nuclear facilities. But despite the opposition from the other members, the US went on to blame Iran for breaching the deal and it quit the agreement in 2018 and reinforced crippling economic sanctions on Iran. This had again increased tensions between US and Iran over the last three to four years. And now with a new administration in place in the United States, attempts are being made to revive the nuclear deal. And hence, since last year, JCPOA negotiations have begun again amongst these members to revive the nuclear deal and restore normalcy in the relations between Iran and the Western countries. This topic is in news because according to this article in the Hindu, Iran's foreign minister is headed to Russia for discussions related to the revival of the nuclear talks as the negotiations have currently been stalled by Russia after the breakout of the war with Ukraine. And now Russia, which has been hit by Western sanctions, has demanded new guarantees that it will not proceed with the JCPOA negotiations until the Western countries guarantee that Russian ties with Iran are not impacted by the economic sanctions of the Western countries. Now let's take a look at the fourth question. PM Swanidhi scheme was launched to benefit small and marginal farmers, tribal artisans, street vendors, women-led self-help groups. The correct answer is option C. This scheme was launched in 2020 to primarily benefit street vendors. This topic is in news because according to this press release from the finance ministry, nearly 2.8 million beneficiaries have benefited under the PM Swanidhi scheme. This scheme, which stands for PM Street Vendors Atmanirbhar Nidhi, was launched with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs in June 2020 after the pandemic broke out. As the nationwide lockdown had a crippling effect on the well-being of street vendors, the government sought to provide affordable working capital in the form of concessional loans to street vendors to resume their livelihoods which had been adversely affected by the pandemic and the lockdown. This scheme is a central sector scheme which is entirely funded and implemented by the center and the funds are not released to states for dispersal to beneficiaries. Instead, the loan amount is directly released to the beneficiaries by the central lending institutions. Under the scheme, street vendors can avail a working capital loan of up to 10,000 rupees, which they can repay in monthly installments. If they make the repayment on time or provide for early repayment, they are also eligible for interest subsidy at the rate of 7% per annum. And there are no penalties as well for any early repayment. This entire scheme is being implemented by SIDB or the Small Industries Development Bank of India to primarily promote the livelihood of street vendors, which has been completely disrupted by the pandemic and the lockdowns. Now let's take a look at the previous year's question from the 2020 prelims paper. If you withdraw 1 lakh rupees in cash from your demand deposit account at your bank, the immediate effect on aggregate money supply in the economy will be to reduce it by 1 lakh rupees, to increase it by 1 lakh, to increase it by more than 1 lakh, to leave it unchanged. The correct answer is option D. See, aggregate money supply in the economy refers to the total cash or currency that's available with the public and the total cash and currency that's present in demand deposit accounts. So when you make a withdrawal from your demand deposit account, the cash or currency is just moving from the demand deposit accounts into the direct hands of the public. But this does not change aggregate money supply in the economy. Hence, the right answer is option D, to leave it unchanged. Now coming to the fact of the day, Let's take a look at this explainer article from the text and context page of the online edition of the Hindu. This article refers to man pads or man portable air defense systems, which have been depicted in the images over here. Man pads are essentially anti aircraft missile systems, which can be operated by individual soldiers or a small group of soldiers and can be fired very easily by placing them on their shoulders itself. And these manpad air defense systems are considered to be very effective in targeting aerial threats. 
This topic is in news because recently the United States has approved a $200 million arms package for Ukraine to help Ukraine fight back against the Russian invasion. This arms package would include US made Stinger missiles and Javelin missiles, which are types of shoulder fired man pads and man pads, respectively. Man pads are essentially short range, lightweight, portable surface to air missiles that can be fired by individual soldiers or by a small group of soldiers to target enemy aircraft and helicopters which are breaching the airspace of their country. Man pads are very similar to man pads and it stands for man portable anti tank systems. They work in a similar manner as that of man pads but they are used to target and destroy military tanks which are invading the country. So man pads are very effective to tackle aerial threats by bringing down low flying aircrafts and helicopters. Man pads are very effective in targeting enemy battle tanks. Example for man pads include the Stinger missile of the United States, which is a surface to air missile to target enemy aircrafts and helicopters. Example for man pads includes the Javelin missile system, which is primarily an anti tank missile. The biggest advantage of these platforms is that they can be easily fired from your shoulder. You can launch them from anywhere atop a ground vehicle, fire them from a tripod or a stand, or even from a helicopter or a boat. They weigh very less roughly around 10 to 20 kilograms and they are not longer than 1.8 meters. They are relatively lightweight compared to other weapon platforms and they can be easily operated by a single soldier or by a small group of soldiers. The biggest advantage is that man pads and man pads can be operated with very less training and man pads which are meant for air defense, they come with a range of 8 kilometers and they can engage aerial targets at altitudes of 4.5 kilometers. These systems they come with a fire and forget guidance system, which means that the soldier who's using the weapon system need not worry about guiding the missile to its target. He just needs to fire and run and take cover immediately. But the missile will stay locked onto the target because these missiles are fitted with infrared seekers that identify and seek out the target by tracing the heat signature of the aircraft. Now, the reason why Ukrainian forces have been able to resist the Russian invasion is mainly because they have been effectively using the man pads and man pads supplied by US and NATO, which has led to significant damage against Russian aircrafts and Russian battle tanks. So with this, let's conclude our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.